In this segment, we're going to introduce the concept of part of speech tagging. So a lot of what we've talked about so far has been uh, things like bag of words techniques and particularly for various classification problems. So this is a you know, fairly effective way to do a lot of classification if we want to uh, you know, if, if we want to predict things like sentiment and do so with end-to-end uh, -end neural networks. But if we want to start to build up towards more structured linguistic abstractions, we need to start thinking about how to represent, uh, basically how to represent what words and language mean and how they function in a slightly deeper way. And so part of speech tagging is going to be our first step towards doing this. We're going to look at language as kind of the sequence of uh, syntactic abstractions over the words and see what that allows us to do. So the reason we might want to do this is the following. Let's say we have this word. And we want to feed this into a TTS system. Now, what should TTS say? So there's two ways to pronounce this. It's either record or record. Um, and we can thank the English language for being weird in this regard. Uh, but basically, in order to determine this, we need to know whether this is a noun or a verb, right? Are we recording something or are we putting a, on a record to listen to? So another, another thing we might uh, kind of be interested in is, let's say we're doing some kind of information extraction. Um, and we're going to take the example of arms. So is this a noun? Or a verb? Are we talking about arming people, or are we talking about you know either our arms or weapons or something like that? And so the you know obviously there's kind of deeper questions that we want to be able to answer here. For example, if we do have a, a noun form of arms, what kind of arms are we talking about? But this is a first step towards uh, at least getting some idea as to uh, what's going on. You know deeper than the surface structure, deeper than just the sequence of uh, characters associated with each of these uh, associated with each of these words. And the other th the, the last thing that this is going to really be is it's going to be uh, a kind of first stage towards uh, thinking about syntactic parsing. And parsing is going to let us take large and complicated sentences and uh, you know, turn them and, and basically start to unpack their structure. And so this is going to be a building block towards allowing us to do that. OK. So we have to think about uh, what the part of speech tags are and, and what they mean. And we're going to kind of go through a crash course in that so that we understand the kinds of linguistic abstractions we're dealing with going forward. So there are going to be two rough categories here. Um, we are going to have what are called open class tags. And roughly, these are ones where you, know, you can imagine like you know, new words uh, can join these categories. Um, and so you know, an example of an open class uh, part of speech tag are the nouns. Uh, so we have both proper nouns like you know IBM, Italy, and also what we call common nouns, um, things like cat or snow. And so the reason this is open class is because we're inventing new devices all the time, right? You know, computers didn't exist, and then they did. Um, you know, sort of new proper nouns associated with companies and things like that. There's always new words joining this class. Um, verbs. This is another uh, another one. Uh, adjectives. Uh, and adverbs. Um, 
you know, things like swiftly that are, that are kind of modifying verbs here. All right. So in terms of closed class tags, we have uh, a few more categories that are typically related more to kind of function words. And uh, these you might be less familiar with. So the first one we have here are determiners, um, which are going to be the, some, and, and other words like this. So this includes articles. And basically, uh, these are words that uh, can modify nouns as part of noun phrases. And so what they allow us to do is say, you know, the cat versus a cat. The choice of article or determiner there is going to change how we uh, interpret that noun, those, each of those noun phrases. Um, whether we think that we're talking about some generic cat or you know a cat that's already in the discourse or something else. Conjunctions are another one, and or uh, pronouns. Um, and then we have a couple of verbal categories here, like auxiliaries. Um, for example, had when it's followed by a verb. So, um, you know, just saying like I had three apples uh, is not an auxiliary, but I had gone to the store when blah, blah, blah. That, that is an example of it as an auxiliary. Um, and then also modals, which, uh, you know, are words like could like I could have gone to the store, that implies uh, a certain modality of the, uh, you know, ab about the statement, you know, your ability to do it in this case. So uh, these are both, uh, these are both sort of types of verbs that typically get tagged in a different, um, in, in a different fashion. And, uh, you know, they're closed class because we're not, we're not always coming up with uh, new, constructions basically surrounding uh, different types of modality or, or different ways of expressing tense and things like that. Uh, and then the last two uh, list here are prepositions, um, things like up, in, to. Um, so for example, when you say like hike up a mountain, you know, that's a preposition. There's also a notion of what are called particles, um, which overlap heavily with the prepositions, um, but these are going to be uh, used in a slightly different way. So for example, when we say, we, I, I made up the story, um, this is what's called a verb particle construction. And you, there's sort of like one way to think about it is there's not really a kind of spatial aspect associated with making up a story, right? Um, it's really this, uh, this word that's kind of combining with the verb in order to get its semantics. And uh, so in, in contrast with the preposition, it's, it's behaving a little bit differently. Um, but the, the words that actually get used overlap there. And so uh, this is an example of why things are kind of ambiguous from a part of speech perspective beyond things we've already seen before. Okay, so these are examples. This is kind of a crash course in some of the basic uh, syntactic uh, part of speech categories that we're gonna see. Now let's look at an example. And this example is gonna help us think about what kinds of ambiguities show up and why this task of trying to take a sentence and analyzing what part of speech uh, each word falls into might be difficult for uh, an automatic system. So Fed raises interest rates 0.5%. So a lot of the examples, a lot of the early uh, work on uh, syntax in NLP for English was done on this data set called the Penn Tree Bank, taken from the Wall Street Journal. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of kind of financial text in here. So what you could do is take a minute and think about what are the different possible part of speech tags that might be associated with each of the words in this sentence. 
So if you, if you look at it and kind of think about each word in isolation, you should be able to come up with uh, a kind of set of possibilities. And so uh, I encourage you to do that, you know, but now I'm going to tell you what, uh, what they are. So I'm going to use part of speech tags that correspond to the categories on the previous slide, but are actually uh, a little bit more refined. These are the actual um, categories in the Penn Tree Bank data that you uh, are going to see some throughout this course. You're not expected to have uh, a kind of encyclopedic knowledge of these. I'll kind of define them as we go. So Fed. The, you know, in the canonical way that we're interpreting the sentences, the, the sentence, um, you know, the, uh, you know, we, we, are, we are using this as a proper noun. Uh, so that, that gets the tag NNP. Um, two other possibilities are two different types of verbs. So... What is the difference between these things? Um, so when I say like I fed someone something, that's uh, VBD. That's just like past tense. If you said I had fed, there we get this participial usage of it, and uh, it's VBN in that case. Okay, so. Actually, for that word, which, you know, the first time I showed you the sentence, you probably had no trouble understanding. There's actually three different tags uh, and three different interpretations for it. All right. Raises. Um, this, is a this is a plural noun. Um, that's what NNS means. Um, but the other possibility is that it can be a verb, right? Um, like he, you know, raises up the, his hand. Interest, uh, again, this can be a noun um, or two different types of verbs. For example, uh, I interest you in NLP, hopefully. That's a VBP. Um, or I want to interest you. Um, and this is, the, this is the infinitive form of the verb. Um, so that's, that's just this, this, this kind of bare VB here. All right. Rates. Again, plural noun or verb. Uh, and then 0.5 and percent uh, each only have one interpretation. Okay, but even setting aside all of the kind of crazy tags that can't show up in the sentence, we actually get a whole, you know, pretty large number of different interpretations, right? Um, so the number of paths to this sentence, if we think about it, uh, is 3 times 2 times 3 times 2, which is 36. So we're going to need a model that can look at all of these 36 paths and decide what is actually reasonable. Now, another thing I want you to think about is what are the reasonable paths to this sentence? So which one corresponds to the kind of correct intended interpretation? And are there others which correspond to some interpretation that, that might be true, even if it's a little bit weird? So the correct interpretation is this one. The Fed raises, uh, where the Fed, Fed is a noun, raises is a verb, and then the interest rates uh, is this noun-noun compound. Um, now, notice, you, you, you know, we're often going to see cases where, like, two nouns get, like, jammed together into a noun phrase. That's okay. It doesn't, it, interest is not an adjective in this case. Um, it's okay to have two nouns uh, kind of combining in this way. All right. There is another interpretation, though, which I want you to see if you can spot. Another interpretation that you can get for this sentence is the following. So roughly what we have here is we have an idea of fed raises as both nouns. And then interest becomes the verb. And then rates and, and uh, 
you know, rates is a noun again. So, uh, you know, thinking about this sentence, for example, um, what, we, what we sort of have going on here is we have this idea of Fed raises, and they are interesting to the rates. They are causing rates to be interested. Rates, in this case, are some sort of animate thing that can express interest. Um, and they're, they're interesting them a little bit. They're, they're interesting them half a percent. Okay, so this is a little bit kind of nonsensical here. Um, you know, it, it sort of doesn't, we can't really think of why someone would say this. But, uh, you know, if you stretch your brain a little bit, this, you know, the, in sort of an Alice in Wonderland way where there's rates that are kind of running around, like you can contort yourself to believe in this interpretation. And in particular, this is going to be something that's very easy for a part of speech tagger or later syntactic parsers to produce. Because, you know, we're really using our, our kind of world knowledge about the fact that like rates are inanimate and so blah, blah, blah. But like syntactically, this is completely valid. So this kind of illustrates two things here. One is it gives you some practice thinking about what part of speech tags we have here, how they interact, et cetera. Um, and it also shows you an example of the kinds of ambiguity that we're going to need to be dealing with and how challenging it is to, to part of speech tag even a relatively simple sentence like this one. That's the end of this segment. <laughs>